Well, it has already been a very exciting morning. Who's excited to be here? I can't tell you how excited I am to be with you all. It's a great group of people today. I want to say hi to everybody online. Make some noise for everybody that's joining us online today. There you are. We're, every week we're so excited to host all of you. That's how we see it. We're so excited that you are here. Uh, I also want to point out, there, it wasn't just the three that were on stage before. I somehow ended up in a black shirt today too. And then somebody else, Pastor Miranda is back from her sabbatical. Guess what she's wearing this morning? I don't know what happened. Pastor Bruce, you're wearing a patterned shirt, man. I don't know what happened. It's dark blue. It's close. It's close. So last week, we started our series on the seven churches of Revelation. In Revelation 2 and 3, there were seven real letters to seven real churches of that day. It wasn't figurative. It wasn't symbolic. These were real words that John actually sent via a messenger to these seven churches. And uh, do, do, these church, or do these cities sound like spices to anybody else? <laughs> You've got your Ephesus, your Smyrna today. We've got Pergamum coming up. We've got some Th Thyatira and then Philadelphia. No, that's, they had their work cut out for them. They had to preach the gospel to a bunch of Eagles fans. I don't know what. <laughs> Anyways, today, how we usually end our services is we have people gather in the groups uh, of people that they're sitting around to talk through these connect questions. What is God speaking to you today? What is one next step that you can take this week to, to walk that out? And then how can we be praying for you? We want to know how we can surround you in prayer. And so, although Revelation was written by John, these are really Jesus' words speaking through him. And I think it's really cool that since Jesus died and rose and ascended into heaven and then the church dispersed all around the world at that time, uh, Jesus kind of took a step back and let it all marinate for a little while. And then in Revelation 2 and 3, it's really the only time that we see Jesus come back and give feedback to some of those churches. He tells them how they're doing and what he thinks of their progress. Yikes! Can you imagine that? Imagine a mailman drops off a letter to Real Life Church and Pastor Jim opens it in front of all of us and reads us how Jesus himself thinks that we are doing. That makes me a little jittery just thinking about it. But that's the point. It wasn't written to us. It was written to the, uh, the people of the church in Smyrna at that time, but it was written for us. You'll see why. There's a lot of really important information here for us to have. So that's what we're going to do today. I invite you to stand with me for the reading of these verses. This is Revelation 2, 8 through 11, titled, To the Church of Smyrna. To the angel of the church in Smyrna write, these are the words of him who is the first and the last, who died and came to life again. These are the words of Jesus. I know your afflictions and your poverty, yet you are rich. I know about the slander of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are instead a synagogue of Satan. Do not be afraid of what you are about to suffer. I tell you, the devil will put some of you in prison to test you, and you will suffer persecution for 10 days. Be faithful, even to the point of death, and I will give you life as your victor's crown. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. The one who is victorious will not be hurt at all by the second death. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, once again, we're so thankful for what you're doing and for what you have already done, Lord. As we read these verses and break them down, see what they mean, I pray that you would bring supernatural meaning and help us to apply it to our daily life. Lord, we love you. Open our eyes to see this morning. In your name we pray, amen. You can have a seat. Imagine receiving that letter. Awesome. Even for me, I know how I reacted when I first read it. We were divvying up who was going to preach what this summer, and Pastor Jim approaches me 
saying, you get an easy one. This is one of the two churches of the seven that Jesus actually says is doing a good job. And so I said, sweet, easy Sunday. And then I actually read the verses. Not sweet, not easy, not easy. I was like, Pastor Jim, this is your church. This is my church. You want me to preach on suffering and martyrdom Sunday? You want me to do have that job? But seriously, imagine showing up and the pastor says, you guys aren't gonna believe it. We got a letter from Jesus himself. And he says that we're doing a really good job. Isn't that great news? In fact, we're doing such a good job that he tells us we should prepare to die. I bet that drew a crowd. What do you title that sermon? But for real, what, what do you think their response was? Were they angry? Were they disappointed? Yeah, yeah, probably, probably a lot of them. Because at first glance, this does not seem like good news. That's what it looks like at first, but it's really so much more than that. Here's the truth. I want to first go back and talk about some of the truth of Jesus. Are you ready for that? Following Jesus does not make life easier. It doesn't make life easier. A lot of people have fallen away from faith because they were told that living for Jesus would take away all of their problems and it was going to make life a lot easier. But following Jesus does not make life easier. He never promises us that, but he promised that life would be harder, actually. In John 15 and Mark 13, he says, if they hated me, they're definitely going to hate you. So expect some resistance. It doesn't make life easier, but he did say that his presence would make life better, life to the full. John 10.10 10 says this, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. The NLT says this, uh, I, I come so they would have a rich and satisfying life, which sounds a lot like I know of your affliction and poverty, but you are rich, right? Matthew 6, 19 through 21, do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moths and vermin destroy and where thieves break in and steal. In other words, it's all temporary here. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where that stuff doesn't happen. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And Jesus was more concerned with us living a full, sold out, kingdom of heaven focused life. And even on the cross, when Jesus hung on the cross and the man next to him professed faith in him in that moment, Jesus didn't snap his fingers and save him, bring him to the ground only for him to then endure more earthly suffering Instead, Jesus gave him a promise, and it was the best promise that anyone could ever receive. In Luke 23, 43, he tells the man, truly I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. So which would you rather have? See, with an eternal perspective, we actually realize that this letter to Smyrna, though it doesn't look like good news at first, the letter to Smyrna is truly a message of hope. This message first from Jesus to the church of Smyrna and then to us is not a premonition of doom, but in these four verses, it's truly a thorough message of hope, one to bring peace and one to be a balm to an anxious heart. But before we understand what this message means to us, we first have to understand what it meant to them. So this city of Smyrna, it's a massive port city located at the end of a large bay, incredibly beautiful, incredibly prosperous because of the business from that port. Some of the richest people at the time lived there. It was an amazingly beautiful, rich, and an Instagrammable place to live in all of Roman Greece. By the way, when I typed in Instagrammable into Word, to write this, the little red dotted line did not appear. And after some searching, after some studying, I found that it does belong in the Cambridge Dictionary, and there is some heated debate, but it has two M's. So don't tell me you didn't learn anything today. So there's this beautiful, thriving city, and in the midst, a righteous church 
struggling to survive, even though, or rather because, it seems, they were doing everything right. Jesus himself said so. See, the dominating religion in Smyrna was emperor worship. Nolan talked about this last week. It was They worshiped the emperor of Rome. There was even a statue of him in the middle of the city where people could come and leave offerings and leave sacrifices and worship him as a god. And of course, because the church refused to participate in this, they were, uh, they were received as outcasts, regarded as slaves, or maybe even lower than slaves. The church of Smyrna had kept their first love. They had been faithful and loving and generous, but why are we bring, being persecuted if we're doing everything right? Why are we being thrown out? They probably saw all of this violence escalating, and they were probably saying, what do we do? If we continue, bad things are obviously going to happen. We could die. Our families could die. The gospel in our city could be wiped out as our church dies. And then the letter from John arrives. Let's dive back into it. Revelation 2.8. To the angel of the church in Smyrna write, These are the words of him who is the first and the last, who died and came to life again. So first, He establishes that these are the words of Jesus himself. Jesus is saying, I've got a new thing to say. I'm coming in hot, so you gotta listen up, everybody. But he's also setting up this running theme of contrasting and impossible statements. I'm the first and the last. I died and I came to life again. He's reestablishing to them, I'm a God that can do the impossible I already have. You can trust me to see the things that you might not understand, and you can trust me because I've actually already experienced all of these things before. He follows that with three more contrasting statements. The first one in verse 9, I know your afflictions and your poverty, yet you are rich. How can that be, Jesus? Well, again, they're outcasts due to their refusal to worship the emperor of Rome, They suffered real persecution. Again, they were denied a real place in society more akin to slaves than citizens. So how can they, how can they, how can this be if they're denied that wealth and hated by just about everyone? They could have even said, we were born here too. We have rights. We should fight because this is our city too. And Jesus says, I know your affliction. He's not only aware, but he's familiar with it. He experienced it too. In John 15, 18, he says, if the world hates you, understand that it hated me first. You're not alone. I understand. But take heart because you are rich. Although you're materially and socially poor, you're rich in spirit. Remember, I have come to give them a rich and satisfying life, not with money, not with stuff that's going to burn up and eventually wither away, but as long as you're rich in the fruit of my spirit, I am with you and I can provide all that you need. The second contrasting statement, also in verse 9, I know about the slander of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. A strong language. But it's actually really interesting. This tells us that there were non-Jesus following Jews. There were traditional groups of Jews in the area, maybe in Smyrna, somewhere, maybe somewhere else in Rome. But they were probably at the center of why the church was enduring so much persecution. Because you see, at the time, Jews were actually given a pass in Rome. They had been an established culture and religion long enough that Rome basically told them, you can do whatever you want. We've got a truce here. And the church in Smyrna, they weren't Christian yet. We use that word, but they didn't really see themselves that way yet. They really saw themselves as Jews still, but instead Jews in the truest form because their Messiah had come and he had fulfilled all of their laws. And this means that they could have freely worshipped under the rule of Rome. And so what happened? It means that Jewish leaders had gone to Rome and whispered in their ear, these guys aren't with us. You should take them out. 
They were betrayed by people that should have been their friends, directly leading to persecution, imprisonment, torture, and death of the members of the church. So what is Jesus saying here? Is this anti-Jewish rhetoric? No, not at all. He's not saying that they're Satanists. He's saying that they're not true Jews because they don't recognize his authority. He says, I know. Again, I'm not just aware, but I'm familiar. Do you remember when I was betrayed to Rome by a group of Jews? It happened to me too. I know what happened. It wasn't right. It wasn't fair. Whether they know it or not, they are not real Jews because they don't recognize my authority. And whether they know it or not, they're actually working for the enemy. He acknowledges what happens. And how does Jesus instruct them to respond? Does he tell them to reverse what happened? To at the very least confront what happened and put up a fight for their rights? No. He goes on in verse 10 to say, do not be afraid of what you are about to suffer. It's going to happen. It's not going to be easy. But do not be afraid. I tell you, the devil will put some of you in prison to test you and you will suffer persecution for 10 days. This probably meant that it was going to be a temporary time and they would have the opportunity to denounce Christ and get out of that imprisonment and suffering, but it's an encouragement to stay strong and to stay faithful. And here's the third contrasting statement. Be faithful even to the point of death, and I will give you life as your victor's crown. And see, the crown isn't a reference to kings and rulers. Instead, they would have understood this reference of crowns to sports. If you think back to the original Olympics, you'd see that someone that won a competition, won a race, won in wrestling, they would give them a wreath to wear on their head as a crown. It's a reward of honor. So Jesus calls them to a higher understanding. The winner is the one who loses, The winner is the one who dies, and the reward is everlasting life. Jesus says, I know because I already did it. I've been through it all before. Instead of a warrior's death, going down in a blaze of glory, taking down as many as he could, he instead offered himself willingly. To use imagery from the Bible, the victorious lion first gave himself as the slain lamb, and he invites them to do the same. Verse 11, whoever has ears, he's talking to us now. If you have ears, listen up. That's what it's saying. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. The one who is victorious will not be hurt at all by the second death. So what does that mean? Well, first we have to talk about birth. The first birth is when we're born from our mother. It's the birth of the flesh. And then in John 3, Jesus introduces this idea of the second birth, a rebirth of the soul of the spirit into the kingdom of God. So then there's the first death, which is the death of the body, of the flesh. And the second death is the death of the soul. The Jews would have understood Because to them, after the first death, the spirit goes to the afterlife. And if that afterlife is devoid of God's presence, it has experienced a true death because it's cut off from God. That second death was of greatest concern. To God, that was of the utmost importance. He says, if you're going to be worried about anything, be concerned that you aren't with me after all of this is done. But if you remain faithful through the suffering you are about to endure, there is nothing to fear. And how does that happen? Well, again, it's the victory. Again, it's not when our culture has won. It's not when the Romans and false Jews have been vanquished. It's not when you've taken up the sword and gone down in a blaze of glory. Victory is when you have lived, surrendered, and died on behalf of Jesus. So now we have the full understanding of the letter to its intended audience. But what about us? What does this mean to the church in America in the 21st century? Well, I heard this very statement this week, and actually 
meant a lot to me. It said this, every generation of Christianity has suffered their own persecution. And from the song we were singing today, he's faithful through generations. Amen. We're still here because even though people have gone through this suffering, Jesus was never leaving them alone. And I don't have to tell you that ours is different and lesser. We don't have to talk a long time about that. Compared to the church of Smyrna, even to real suffering uh, many modern Christians today experience around the world, ours is much more of a suffering of inconvenience. Yeah? Yeah? Come on, if one of the battles we've been facing is the war on Christmas, we're doing okay. (laughs) All I'm going to say, I'm going to put it to bed. Of course, we're not experiencing the same suffering as the church of Smyrna. But we do still face our, our own kind of discomfort and discord today. And I agree with Pastor Jim. Things don't look the way that they did a long time ago. Things are changing rapidly in America. For better or for worse, they don't look different, or they look a lot different than they did 20 years ago, or even 10 years ago, or even five years ago. And I get that for so many people, there is fear and uncertainty and a lot of anxiety wrapped up in that. There's even pressure to put up our fists and fight back. There's a culture war going on, and we gotta get on the offensive. And I'm not saying that we shouldn't be involved in political conversations. We should be making it a better world and confronting these things. But the question is, where does our hope lie? Where does our peace come from? Do we put our trust in people? No. Do we put our trust in earthly storehouses? No. There's only one who can offer hope and peace. And I've been reading these scriptures a lot this week, and I can give you a word from the Lord today. It is going to be okay. It is going to be okay. If you take home one thing from the message on the church of Smyrna, these four verses in Revelation say this, that no matter what happens, no matter what we face, whether it's, in, it's a simple, uncomfortable conversation with a neighbor, or if we get to the point where the government is dragging us out of our homes and putting us to death, Jesus' words are this. It is not going to be easy, but it is going to be okay. Take heart. Do not be afraid of what you are about to suffer. Be faithful even to the point of death, and I will give you your victor's crown. So it's not easy to say, but persecution, let it come. Do not be consumed by fear and anger. Is it wrong? Yes. Is it unfair? Yes. But our treasure is not in what is right and fair and just in the world. Our treasure is not even in life itself. But our treasure is the eternal Jesus, the eternal good news of Jesus. Let those who have ears hear, the one who is victorious will not be hurt at all by the second death. Okay, so that's great. That's good news. That's great news. I'm really happy about that. But you might be wondering, so what? So what do we do now? What do we stand to gain today from these verses in Revelation? Do we just sit around and be quiet and wait for all of these things to happen? What now? Well, the danger in our kind of persecution is how easy it is to put our heads down and be unassuming, love and support from the side, avoid discomfort that comes with being forthcoming about our faith, and blend into the materialism that we've been raised to believe is our right. I love this quote from C.S. Keener. The martyrdom of our brothers and sisters in the past as well as the martyrdom of many in other locations in the present, must challenge us to count the cost. How much is Jesus worth to us? We see the church of Smyrna, and we have to ask ourselves, how much is Jesus worth to us? He was worth that much to them. I was literally at Caribou studying and writing this 
this week, and I've got this big book that says Revelation on the front, and I've got it turned down on the table. <laughs> Revelation freaks people out, man. You're welcome. <laughs> I didn't want to ruffle anybody's feathers, but I knew my motivation. I knew my intention. I was trying to hide. And I realized that in doing so, I was actually saying no to any potential conversations that God might have wanted to set up that day. I was saying no. And so as I was putting this message together, my stomach kept getting tied into a knot. And this question kept popping up in my brain. If living a life for Jesus means suffering and meeting that suffering head on, and I'm not suffering... Fill in the blank. If living a life for Jesus means suffering and meeting that suffering head on, and I'm not suffering, then what's going on? The answer might be, well, I only hang out with like-minded people. The answer might be, I, I say no when God gives me opportunities to grow in being generous and having uncomfortable conversations. And I realized that the answer to that question for me was, I'm not making enough of a splash. I'm too scared to get out there and make some noise. I'm spending too much energy just trying to blend in. And it's so natural and easy for us to avoid pain. But if we surround ourselves in bubble wrap, I was thinking about this, and this quote from The Office came to my mind, we create for ourselves a cushy, wimpy, nerf life. Anyone else realizing they have a tendency to live a nerf life? I want to be unafraid to live for Jesus a little bit louder. I want to be unafraid to meet discomfort head on. I want to be uncaring about assumptions about me because I can't be quiet about how much I love Jesus and what he's done for me. Back to the letter to Smyrna. There are three reasons why we suffer and how we can grow through it. He says, I know of your affliction and your poverty, but you are rich. It tells us this, faithfulness amid suffering increases our spiritual wealth and maturity. James 1, 2, and 3 says it this way, consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance, let perseverance finish its work so that, you who be, so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. Who's got that down? God's testing my faith. Woo! That's what we've been waiting for. No, but for real. It challenges us to say, God, you're obviously working. Even when I can't see it, you're working. And God, I'm so excited to see what you have in store this time. Because you've never let me down before. Even Paul says in 2 Corinthians, he talks about having a thorn in his side that God put there to keep him humble. He says that happened so I wouldn't become arrogant. And I don't have a slide for it, but he says this. That is why for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses I delight in insults. I delight in hardships and in persecutions and in difficulties. For when I am weak, God joins me, and then I am strong. If we let perseverance finish its work, it will make us mature and complete, not lacking anything, but giving us all that we need Number two, I know the slander of those who say they are Jews and they're not. It says this, faithfulness amidst suffering brings good to the world. God alone holds retribution. God holds the victory and the justice. See, there have been times and there will be times when we're attacked. Injustice happens. But God tells us to remain faithful to him and to goodness. Romans 12, 17 do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be very careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. 
Do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath, for it is written, it is mine to avenge. I will repay, says the Lord. He knew what it, what it would do to our hearts. On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. And let me tell you, sometimes your enemy are the people that are supposed to be on your team. That's one of the biggest pieces of wisdom I received in the last few years is that if you've been hurt by someone who's supposed to be on your team, and I know there are a lot of people in our church that have wounds from past church hurt, he says this, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. We talked about this in the last few months. That means you bring righteousness to that person and to yourself. You bring righteousness and goodness into the world. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Yeah. Overcome evil with good. TJ, you can come out and play. Do not be afraid of what you are about to suffer. Be faithful, even to death, and I will give you life as your victor's crown. The third point is this. Faithfulness amid suffering increases our dependence on God. And the truth is, it shouldn't be any other way. We strive so hard to become independent from God to make everything that we need, but there's a quote that says, maturity isn't growing independent from God as you would your parents, where, where you cleave from your parents and leave. Instead, maturity is learning to be dependent on God. When we depend on him to be our source, we experience his fullness. In college, there was this other kid training with me to become a pastor and a worship leader, and he just had this fire. He was so vibrant when he would speak and lead worship. He had this innate ability to lean into the presence of God and bring other people along with him. And I found myself wondering how in the world he did that. I even found myself being jealous of his ability to lead in that way because I would try to do similar things and it wouldn't yield the same results. And it wasn't until a class where we were all asked who the most influential person in our lives was that he talked about his mom and his upbringing. He said that there were several years that he his mom and his brother and sister didn't have a consistent place to stay. And they spent most of those nights with his family living under a bridge. Even though he saw her wrestle, he never saw his mom lose faith in God's provision for the next day. Because of her, he said he was in that chair and if she had that kind of faith, he could too. And I realized his experience being so desperate for God, he knew what it was like to have that closeness, a closeness that I would never understand unless I learned to depend on God and be desperate for him in the same way. It's the same dependence that we see thriving in persecuted churches all around the world today. People are experiencing God in such an extreme way because their lives, their very lives depend on him and they're desperate for him to move. And so here and now in our homes, in our neighborhoods and church and in our schools and workplaces and relationships, the letter to the church in Smyrna encourages us to be faithful and obedient to the will of God. Facing suffering head on and finding comfort in his promise. How much are we willing to put aside comforts? But even more, how much are we willing to rejoice in the suffering and chase after the real reward set before us? As I end today, I leave you with these words that challenged me so deeply, and I hope that they challenge you in the same way. There was a man named Polycarp, that sat under the very teaching of the John that wrote the book of Revelation. And not long after Smyrna would have received this letter, Polycarp became a leader in that very church and an influential part of the community. As it happened, the words in the Lord's letter to the church in Smyrna came true. 
And for decades, the church experienced persecution, imprisonment, and death at the hands of the Romans. Polycarp, the leader in the church of Smyrna, was no exception, and he was eventually captured and killed. However, he was so well-liked throughout the city that it is said that even the guard that led him to the stake pleaded with Polycarp to denounce Jesus so that he could live and continue doing his good work in the city. But Polycarp had taken these words of God to heart and had a wholly eternal perspective, and he responded in this way. This is what he said. 86 years I have served Jesus, and he has done me no wrong. How then can I blaspheme my king and savior? You threaten me with a fire that will last for an hour at most, but I'm not ignorant of the fire of everlasting punishment that is prepared for the wicked. They tied him to the stake, and before he died, he said, I bless you, Father. I bless you, Father, and I give thanks that you have counted me worthy to be among the number of those that have died for your cause. He considered himself one of the lucky ones. And then he went home, and I can only imagine that he was presented with the victor's crown of life. There's hope. We can have hope. No matter what happens here, Jesus promises us that if we remain faithful and keep the eternal perspective there is no thing on this earth that can take his reward, which is true, full life. His reward is himself. No thing can take that away from us. Let's pray. Jesus, we thank you. We give you glory, Father, for your goodness. Lord, we thank you for your faithfulness. Lord, show us how to be faithful back to you. Pray that you would make those opportunities obvious to us where you're speaking to us and showing us how to grow. I pray that you would give us the strength to rejoice through trials, God. I want to grow in that way. I want to be loud for you, Jesus. Help me to do that, God. I lean into you. And if you're joining us today and you've never accepted Jesus as your Savior, our eyes are all still closed, I want you to know that there is room at that table. And in fact, there's a seat with your very name on it. And Jesus is waiting to accept you with open arms if you're willing to accept his invitation. So with every eye closed, if you want to receive salvation today, or if you would like to learn more about what that means, would you put up your hand? and I'd love to connect with you after the service. For those online, if you resonate with those words, Pastor Jim is coming up in, a, in just a moment and he has information for how you can get in touch with us and we'd like to give you direction on how to start that journey with Jesus. Lord, continue to guide us, continue to show us how to love, continue to show us how to be a faithful church that follows you so closely. In your name we pray. Amen.